Trance, again, is not a term that is used indigenously. This is, again, a, a sort of Western term for a broad set of phenomena. And people will have their own vocabulary, and it will usually not name it as a state of consciousness of the person. In other words, when the donkey gets possessed, the important point is not that the donkey's in a trance. The important point is that he's now possessed. It's not about him. It's, he's, he's, he's absent. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's been uh, inhabited now by the spirit, and that's what's important. So this is a psychological term that is implying there's something about consciousness, about attention, something. As I say, it was very popular in the 60s when there was this notion of altered states of consciousness, that we would have all kinds of things and there could be a field of study that would include everything from being high on uh, you know, uh, uh, marijuana or LSD or whatever. And this goes back even further, of course, to the whole interest in psychedelic drugs and uh, in the beat generation and then the term psychedelic, which was a term that um, uh, that Humphrey Osman, a, a psychiatrist uh, in Saskatchewan, proposed to Aldous Huxley uh, for the kinds of experiences. That, and Huxley was very interested in this idea that, uh, that hallucinogens, LSD, would open the doors of perception. Uh, and so that this was a very, um, uh, say, romantic view of this idea of enhancing human potential. And that goes along with the idea, again, that these altered states of consciousness somehow are other modes of operating that might be accessible to us and we might be able to do extraordinary things. For the most part, in terms of hypnosis, there's no evidence that anybody can do anything in hypnosis they can't do outside of hypnosis. Uh, there's no magical abilities or talents that anybody develops. And stage hypnotists capitalize on mythology. So they'll show somebody, they'll put two chairs, let's say, and they'll have somebody put their head on, and shoulders on one chair and their feet on another, and the person's just suspended between two chairs, and then they'll get somebody to stand on them. I don't recommend you go do this at home, but in fact it can be done. It has nothing to do with hypnosis. There are just a lot of things we're not aware that we can do uh, that look very dramatic when they're done that way, and you think, wow, okay, you know, something amazing is happening. Similarly, for things like one of the, the simpler claims, I suppose, or more plausible claims to many people's mind is that, well, somehow through hypnosis, Hypnosis, you could enhance memory and you could remember all kinds of fabulous things. You could recover childhood memories you never had or you could remember things in great detail. There's no evidence that hypnosis does that either. Uh, what hypnosis does do is it increases uh, recall but not accurate recall. It increases confabulation basically so that you'll, you'll say things or, and you won't be able to tell whether they're real or not. And part of it's because, again, our popular models of memory and of uh, so on are not accurate. Mo the lay image of memory is it's a bit like having a photo album. You know, you've got snapshots from different phases of your life and you can flip the pages and find the photo and maybe, maybe it's a little movie clip that you could watch uh, and you actually then remember things. For the most part, memory is not like that. For the most part, memory is reconstruction. So there are little bits and pieces of, of maybe uh, episodic memory where we have an actual uh, image or something of something, or a little snatch of very uh, uh, vertical memory, and a lot of elaboration and embroidering based on what we think we should remember, what should have been going on at that point. And what happens with hypnosis, or with in, uh, people who are highly suggestible or in, in those kinds of situations, is that people will develop additional memories or elaborate them and uh, won't be able to tell where, where they come from. So the famous experiment was the one that was done here in Montreal at Concordia University in the laboratory of Campbell Perry uh, with uh, Jean-Marc Laurence, who's uh, uh, still uh, at Concordia. Uh, and they did an experiment where they told people, um, last night uh, you were awakened. I, they took highly hypnotizable people. So again, they give a, a questionnaire like these kinds of things I've been doing with you. And they find the people who do great on all of them with no prompting. And they take those people, and those are the ones they work with. So first of all, they're selecting a subgroup of us who are very good at getting absorbed and going with these things and having lots of things happen. Whatever that, whatever that is, we don't fully know what that is, but it's some kind of um, personality trait or ability that people have. Again, that all of us have to some degree, and some people are kind of virtuosos. And uh, so they take those people, and they bring them to the laboratory, and they tell them, uh, we're going to do an experiment now in which I'm going to hypnotize you and then I'm going to tell you certain things and you're not going to remember them. And so then you do hypnosis and you tell the person, last night when you were sleeping, uh, you were awakened by a, a big noise in the middle of the night by a snow plow. You, those of you who are from Montreal know that that could happen. Uh, they come by and they plow your street at 3 a.m. and you're up. Uh, and uh, 
that's it, and, and that's the end. Then they, afterward, the person comes out of hypnosis, and then later they're debriefing them, and they give them a questionnaire in which they ask them, how were you sleeping last night? And the person says, well, I was awakened by a snowplow. And then you say, okay, now tell me really what happened last night. And the person says, well, I was awakened by a snowplow. And they say, okay, I'll give you $25 to tell me what really happened last night. And the person says, well, I was awakened by a snowplow. So in effect, they've constructed this false memory, and the person cannot remember that it was a false memory. That was part of the instruction. So they, you can, and you can do this in highly hypnotized people relatively easily. In all of us, what you can do is that you can show that there's a separation between the memory and source memory. That is, where did you learn something? You know, you can remember certain things, but you may, may not remember when and where you learned it. And so that's also part of what's going on in this kind of situation because you're, in effect, dissociating the two so you don't remember that actually this is something you were just told uh, an hour ago by somebody in, in, in the laboratory. These are, this type of experiment was extremely important, as you can imagine, not only for understanding hypnosis, but because it became a big forensic issue. Because with the rise of dissociation uh, and with the possibility of recovered memories, there were a huge number of claims being made about people suddenly recalling the horrible things that happened to them in the past, and people uh, being taken to court, and people being put in jail, and all kinds of things. And some of these things were very outrageous. Some of these things were um, uh, people recalling that they were part of episodes of satanic ritual abuse, in which they were taken, and there were babies being sacrificed on an altar, and there was all kinds of horrible things happening. Uh, and people would have very elaborate memories of this, and as I say, people were uh, taken into custody, people were tried, some people were convicted, and so on. So it was a very, very serious matter. And we, as far as we know now, uh, in, in virtually no cases were those kinds of extreme memories true, as far as we know. That is to say, nobody ever found uh, such episodes of such practices. There would be traces. Uh, you know, there may well be sporadic uh, violent crimes out there of various kinds, and, and uh, weird things people do, but these particular uh, episodes were so strange and bizarre. And they also began to follow a popular formula. That is, the, these ideas began circulating in society, and so you would find the same kind of accounts coming forward. So all of that's important in terms of understanding um, what, uh, what might be uh, kind of uh, behind this. What are we building on when we're talking about these dissociative phenomena? Well, part of it is that we're looking at uh, a range of normal human experiences that happen spontaneously in people. These are scores from something called the Dissociative Experiences Scale uh, that ask for those kinds of common experiences. Have you ever had uh, a period where uh, you uh, took part in something and then didn't remember and other people reminded of you of it later? Uh, have you ever had an experience where you felt things were not quite real? Uh, so from that kind of last experience, that very mild experience of derealization, which I say many, many people have had, to the more extreme experience of having an actual episode of amnesia. And when you plot that, you get this kind of a curve. So those common experiences are very common, and those more extreme experiences are quite rare. And people who have many, many experiences are also quite rare. So where the dissociative disorders exist, where the problems exist, is out here not at that milder end of the spectrum. The people who are having lots of these symptoms and, uh, and of the more unusual symptoms. What are the correlates of dissociative experience in general? There are personality traits that have been mentioned, been talking a lot about hypnotizability and a little bit about openness. Uh, so those are probably related, not precisely the same, but openness is included again in the five-factor theory of personality I was talking about earlier. It's usually seen as uh, one of the factors, and that broad factor of openness in the five-factor theory is much broader than this facet we're talking here. This facet is really openness to absorbing experiences, because openness in the five-factor theory of personality includes things like uh, being open to uh, cultural diversity uh, and uh, sort of uh, being a kind of curious person and so on, and being a uh, um, uh, broad-minded person, other kinds of things like that that are different facets. So this particular one, though, that's these absorption experiences seems to be the one that's related a bit to <coughs> hypnotizability and in turn to dissociative experiences. The other um, things that uh, years ago Josephine Hilgard found looking at, um, uh, at uh, uh, child development and hypnotizability was that people who are highly hypnotizable, when you ask them about their childhoods, describe a childhood in which uh, one of two scenarios occurred. One was that they had lots of imaginative play. They had uh, imaginary friends. 
Uh, they uh, have very vivid imaginary play, and they ha came from a family that was encouraging, and warm and encouraging and accepting of imaginative play. The other scenario was families that were very rigid and punitive. So it's an interesting dynamic again where personality may be interacting with the environment and, and this then segues into the more severe example which is what's typically talked about in the trauma literature which is the idea that if somebody comes from a very, very abusive environment and they have this dissociative ability then they use it as a way to escape from the environment. That is, they can be somewhere else in their mind. They can, they can get away, and that becomes a, a respite. It kind of saves them from this you know, you know, harsh environment that they're in, whether it's just very harsh in a very rigid sense or whether, in the case of trauma theory, it's an actively uh, violent and, and, and difficult environment. So that's been one of the theories. Now, the trauma literature almost, for a long time, was almost conflating trauma and dissociation. It was almost like a hyphen between the two, uh, with the assumption that somehow you see dissociation mainly in relation to trauma. But I think I've shown you already with some of the examples, particularly with the Don Key, that it's not obvious at all that that's the case. Uh, however, that older literature that looked at, uh, ethnographic literature that looked at all kinds of trans phenomena around the world and found them ubiquitous in all kinds of different religious practices, all kinds of scenarios, and mostly, as I say, as a positive thing, as a thing people were seeking, what was not done in most of those studies was to figure out, okay, but of the people who are most intensely involved and have the greatest ability, could it be that they actually had a traumatic history? Because the people who were doing those ethnographic field studies were not clinicians. The theory was not popular that trauma had something to do with it. And they would not have, have had easy access necessarily to those kinds of stories, even if they'd been you know, around for a while doing field work. It's a rather intimate, you know, serious, dangerous thing to talk about. So there have been some more recent studies looking at African healing cults and some other settings where people have gone and systematically looked for trauma. And indeed, they do find some evidence that the people who are having the most intense uh, dissociative experiences have some history of trauma. So while I still don't think it's an e a simple equation, you know, trauma is not necessary to have dissociation. Dissociation does not automatically indicate that the person had trauma there is a way in which it can reinforce or increase the likelihood. And again, it may not be a direct effect, but it may be just what we're saying, that dissociation becomes an adaptive strategy for people who are facing a lot of trauma and violence. Uh, and they may you know, chance upon it in a way and, and use it as a way to, to cope. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, trauma, though. I, I have um, uh, people that I've seen who uh, have a lot of dissociative experiences uh, who may not have had traumatic experiences, but who recalls a child getting very deeply absorbed and very easily lost in things. And years ago, Stephen uh, J. Lynn wrote about what he called the fantasy-prone personality. The idea that there are people who have very vivid imaginations and can get lost in the imaginations. And I recall one person I uh, knew who said that they actually found, you know, getting lost in their imagination was more interesting than doing other things. So they would spend hours and hours, like, staring out the window daydreaming. So if you really have such a vivid imagination, then, you know, you occupy yourself that way, and maybe ultimately, if you use it adaptively, you become a novelist or a playwright or, you know, some other kind of person who can draw on that. And certainly, if you talk to a lot of novelists, there are different ways of writing novels, but many novelists will literally conjure up the figures and then watch what they're doing and just describe them. So it's like the, the figures in their novel are, have a life of their own and they're acting on their own. So you could say that that's a kind of imaginative absorption uh, that then helps them to do their, their work of being a novelist. Uh, however, if you're really prone to that kind of absorption, it could also be a problem for you. It could, you know, just like with computer games, let's say, you could end up having your social life shrinking because you spend all your time in front of a screen, or of course, hopefully you're connected to other people there, but uh, imaginatively in your head, you might not be connected to other people. They might just be imaginary people you're connected to. Uh, there could be other effects. The other thing to say is that if you have that ability and you're prone to get deeply absorbed and you have other things going on, then they can interact. So being highly uh, hypnotizable, being prone to dissociation, being prone to uh, highly uh, prone to absorbing experiences may not be a problem in its own right. But if you also have a lot of negative affectivity, like we talked about last time, a lot of painful uh, emotional experiences, traumatic experiences, unstable emotion regulation, then these two things can interact. So again, I think of a client I worked with at one point who would have 
uh, could have a dream and would see a witch and then would be recounting it in the office and would freak out because it just became too vivid and it felt like, no, uh, this witch is really present right now and it's real because I can feel it is so present. So you could see an interaction there between, on the one hand, the vivid imaginative ability and then the negative emotion because if what you were visualizing was a very positive thing, maybe you'd be blissed out at that moment. You wouldn't be having a terrible experience. It's the fact that there's also these negative feelings attached to it uh, that is then interacting and making a very unpleasant experience for the person. So that, again, that's an important point to understand that the dissociation itself is not probably, in most cases, pathological. It's, it's in the wrong time and place, and that's partly, again, because it's interacting with other things, with negative feelings, with, with other kinds of things. So the fuller picture of pathological dissociation is probably not going to be just about dissociation. It's going to be about how dissociation interacts with other things. Um, so this is kind of what I've been talking about here, trauma-related. Affective state-dependent learning is interesting because of what I said earlier about the idea of some dissociation not being repression in a kind of Freudian sense of a dynamic process of, of putting things out of consciousness through a kind of cognitive effort, but the idea that memory itself is compartmentalized normally. Right? When you're hungry, you think of things related to food, and you remember things related to food. When you're thirsty, you think of things related to thirst. When you're tired, you think of things related to... So, so your motivational state already is one way that you organize memory, in fact, and you can show differences. Moreover, you, if you take somebody who's manic-depressive, let's say, and you teach them lists of words when they're depressed and lists of words when they're manic, you can show dissociation so that when they're depressed again, they remember the lists of words they learn when they're depressed, but not the ones where they learn when they're manic, and vice versa. So there's mood state-dependent learning. Uh, and it's not, it's not an absolute rigid thing, but it's part of how memory spontaneously gets organized. Uh, it's, uh, there's also drug state-dependent learning, something that was uh, originally described here at McGill, uh, and uh, was an issue for students in the days when people used to make heavy use of pharmaceutical substances. I know people don't do that anymore, but um, uh, so there was a concern that you should not be, uh, you know, uh, taking, uh, uh, well, in the old days, I guess it would have been people taking cannabis, and these days it's probably people taking methylphenidate or Ritalin or something to stay up all night studying. The point is that to some degree, these drugs create state-dependent learning, so that if you take the drug while you're studying and then you go to the exam and you're not taking the drug, you will have slightly less memory of the thing that you're trying to remember than if you took the drug again, because the memory is tied to the drug state. So this is what we mean by state-dependent learning, the idea that there could be affective state-dependent learning, so that when you're in the same emotional state, you recall things that were learned in that emotional state, and if the affect is intense enough, then that could lead to a kind of dissociation across states. So that's the theory behind that. Um, I, mentioned uh, I mentioned sort of uh, emotional instability as something that could interact with dissociation to give rise to phenomena, and I think that's probably part of what goes on in borderline personality disorder, which we mentioned briefly last time in relation to uh, somatization disorder, the idea that there are certain people who have a lot of distress in almost every different aspect of their life, every different aspect of experience. Lots of emotional turmoil and, and, and suffering, and that gets labeled at times in a slightly more specific way than I'm describing as borderline personality disorder. Many of those people have lots of dissociative experiences. And um, years ago, when I was uh, a medical student, I had the occasion to work in a therapeutic community in, in Connecticut called uh, The Country Place. And um, I had a chance to work with somebody there at the time, and I was very young and naive, and I think I just read Fritz Perls and Gestalt Therapy, so I was trying to do Gestalt Therapy with somebody. And uh, this was a, a woman who I didn't know much about, but who was working, I was doing this work, and one of the things that uh, Pearls uh, has you do is he, he, he talks about these aspects of the self that could be called top dog and underdog. And underdog is the part of you that's always getting put down and top dog is the part that's always sort of putting you down. This is like your internal dynamics. So he has you role play, you be top dog, be underdog, and you go back and forth in two chairs and you're sort of interacting with yourself to explore these things. That in itself, I should say, is interesting because people are on, a, again, another normal distribution or spectrum in terms of how easy they find it to do that. There are people at one end of the spec, most of us could do that a little bit with some effort, we could get into it. There are people who take to it like a duck to water, it's no problem. They're who we would call histrionic, right? And they, they're good actors, they just say, oh, you want me to be a different part, a different person, different thing, no problem, they get into it very easily. A little bit like this clip we saw of this guy with these different personalities, I mean, he's, you know. 
Uh, and there are other people who say, what, what do you mean? Say that again, you want me to what? You know, and they cannot really play those different roles. Um, and anyway, this woman was very, very good at it. She got into these roles right away. She, was being, she got into the chair to be top dog. And she started talking in a very different way, different voice, very angrily. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I don't want to deal with any of this. And, and then finally she got really angry and she said, anyway, I don't give a, a damn about all of you here and I'm going to burn the effing place down. So I got a little alarmed that I'd kind of gotten out of my, my, my own safety zone. And I said, okay, now go to the, into the other chair. And she said, no effing way. <laughs> so suddenly this role playing... <laughs> got very, very real, you know, and again, something to think about, what is a role playing and what is a state, you know, because now this person is implying, no, I, I'm in a certain state, or I'm, I'm in a different position here, I don't, I'm not going to shift, I'm within that state, there's nobody to shift to, there's no place I want to go from here, this is me, I'm angry, I'm... So that was a, an alarming moment. Uh, we found a way out of that, actually. Uh, I, I had a, a, a flash, some kind of intuitive flash in terms of trying to figure out how she was functioning. So I turned her chair, the other chair around and asked her to look at the back of the chair and tell me what she was feeling. And she st started getting sad and, and she talked about that. And I turned it back and said, now please get in the chair. And she did. And I said, okay, I think that's enough for today. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, didn't do that anymore. Now, I, in retrospect, and having learned a bit more since then, whatever, I would say, yes, actually, this woman had borderline personality disorder. She was very mild and sweet on the outside, but she experienced a lot of different kinds of splits and polarizations in her experience, and had a lot of anger and a lot of unresolved issues around relationships, and that was getting crystallized in this, this role-playing in a very vivid way. So the argument, again, is that if you take somebody like this and you suggest to them you could be a different person, or there is a different person there, they have no trouble generating that. It's very natural for them. It, it's a, it fits with what they're already sort of experiencing, although they may not be experiencing separate people. So this points to this dilemma, which is that, and this was a critique of the whole epidemic of dissociative identity disorder, is that it can be iatrogenic. It can be caused by physicians, caused by clinicians. Because if you take somebody who is highly suggestible, highly hypnotizable, who's in a lot of emotional turmoil, has a lot of polarities in them, it's very easy for them to start personifying those different aspects of themselves and experiencing them as autonomous in a way. And you can get into a lot of trouble, as I did in a small way in, the, in that story. Um, okay, I think these are the main points I wanted to make uh, here. And so just to rehearse again the history of dissociation in, our, uh, in, in uh, European and, and uh, North American medicine um, to capture a couple of points about how this is something that is present within culture and shaped and reshaped in different ways at different historical periods. So we go back to the time of um, the uh, mid to late uh, uh, 18th century and uh, the work of uh, Franz Anton Mesmer, uh, who became quite the rage in uh, Vienna and then in uh, Paris with his discovery of uh, animal magnetism. So it turned out that there was this magnetic field that pervaded the world and uh, affected an uh, human animal bodies and that people could be magnetized and then they would go into a swoon and might faint or might have seizures. And he created these banquets, these big baths filled with iron filings and people could hold on to these bars and people would swoon and it was uh, both fascinating, entertaining, it was something in between again, uh, medical treatment and uh, popular uh, entertainment. Uh, and uh, at one point, people began to get concerned about this. There were lots of people involved, and so they decided to have a royal commission to investigate Mesmer. Benjamin Franklin was one of the members of the uh, royal commission, came from the U.S. to France to help with this, and they did some very interesting early uh, random, randomized clinical trials in which they uh, magnetized, had uh, uh, Mesmer or somebody else magnetize certain trees and then set somebody loose to try to figure out which trees were magnetized. So it was like a blind. They didn't know which trees were magnetized, and they couldn't identify them. So this was a whole kind of debunking of this process of claims people were making about these magnetic forces. It's interesting as to why they were so concerned about this. There's a very interesting book by the historian Robert Darnton called Mesmerism and the End of the Enlightenment in France. And the point is that this idea of this mesmeric fluid was being employed in political rhetoric uh, 
about uh, democratization and, and liberty and so on, the idea that everybody would have access to this energy and it would not come from the king, it would not be within this hierarchical society that was about to be overthrown. So there's actually a lot of anxiety about this. And that's probably why not purely academic interests, why people decide to investigate this thoroughly. They're convinced that it was a subversive force and it was being used and uh, people who were involved with the early phases of the French Revolution were fascinated by this stuff and were capitalizing on it. So that's an interesting issue for us to think about, too, because there's a, an older dramatic example of the interplay between medical theory and popular ideas about uh, the person and political issues uh, in a way that, you know, because it's far away, we can see it sort of very clearly and maybe happening in subtler ways in our own time. To make that more, maybe less far-fetched for you to, to think about, uh, the rise of, of multiple personality disorder occurred not only in the context of the uncovering of child abuse, as Ian Hacking has written about very well in his book Rewriting the Soul, uh, but also at a time when, uh, because of the um, critique of uh, psychodynamic treatment of personality disorders uh, and severe uh, uh, and mental health problems, which occurred in the wake of the Osherson case in the 70s, um, people were starting to decrease the hospitalization of people with people with personality problems. When I came back from California to uh, Montreal in uh, 1980, 81, uh, the Jewish General Hospital was still hospitalizing people on the ward with borderline personality disorder sometimes for months. Uh, and within a few years, as everywhere else, that practice had been given up on. People had decided that's not working. Uh, it only makes people worse because they get dependent and they get embroiled and we don't really cure the underlying problem and so we need to approach it a different way. But what happened with the rise of multiple personality disorder was here was a severe illness really disabling for people for which the treatment was intensive psychotherapy that could be conducted in an in, inpatient setting. And so actually there were hospitals set up uh, in Canada and the US that had wards expressly for people with severe dissociative identity disorder who could be hospitalized for months and get psychotherapy. There was no medication for this. It was really psychotherapy they were getting. And in fact, Colin Ross, a Canadian psychiatrist who was very involved in a lot of this research, I showed you one of his studies earlier, uh, moved from Canada to Texas uh, to become the head of one of such wards. Uh, so there was a political economic aspect, both within psychiatry and in larger society, to the immense popularity of, of this uh, diagnosis. Uh, in any event, uh, mesmerism gave way to uh, more neurological ideas I mentioned that were uh, present uh, in the, around the, um, in the late uh, 1800s and turn of the century. Uh, and for Charcot, as a neurologist, uh, looking at, um, well, I don't have another picture here, so uh, looking at people with conversion symptoms and other things, he understood these forms of hysteria as fundamentally neurodegenerative uh, problems that could be understood in, in those terms. Uh, and um, at the same time, there was this emerging argument coming from uh, Pierre Genet and others that uh, dissociative symptoms could be understood as more as a, a kind of a cognitive process as something that was related to suggestibility and so on. So, even though when you, I mean, the literature at that time is not the contemporary literature, the debates and the parameters were different, it's interesting that we, you had these competing models and that people are trying to give shape to something. And then Ian Hacking's argument is that not only are they giving shape to it interpretively, but they're actually shaping the sim symptoms themselves. So the question is, how does that shaping happen? So here's a slide to represent that shaping on the smallest, most intimate, microdynamic level now, not at the level of uh, models that are circulating in the larger culture, but in family interactions. So this But the question is, what was going on in this daughter's own self-representation? Because it's not just that her mother's making up a story and she's, you know, she's uh, resentfully going along with it. She was actually experiencing an alteration in her body 
Uh, and you could see how she was being handled and talked about a certain way. So what struck me then was to compare this. Uh, this is a teacher in Bali teaching a girl like the type you saw the photo earlier of the person dancing, teaching her how to dance by manipulating her body, telling her, no, your head goes exactly like this, and your eyes go exactly like this, and they literally do that because it's all eye movements and finger movements. And so there's a kind of influencing the control of the body, yielding, for the, in the case of the child, yielding the control of the body to another person and having it molded. And so what I want to suggest, this is in a, a healthy, uh, positive, celebratory context, but when you talk, and talk to a North American about the idea of somebody controlling their body to that degree, you may get, some people may have a fair degree of anxiety, although I understand that many dancers have had such experiences at certain points of having corrections and so on, and you, know, you have a different way of relating. But certainly in terms of what normative body boundaries are supposed to be in interactions, even within families, uh, that this, what I was describing clinically, was a kind of transgressive phenomenon. And the argument is that I th think that that probably altered this girl's own experience of self-control, of autonomy, of her own body. And so you can see an analogy between this kind of uh, pathological shaping of loss of control, of experiencing your body as though things are happening, not, you know, they're happening to you rather than you doing them, and that could be a kind of uh, reshaping, and uh, which then leads to these kinds of performances. So what's going on when we think of these dissociative phenomena is a variety of different processes that are being I think, mobilized, uh, that give rise to dissociative experience. So rather than thinking that there is some fundamental um, thing to trance or, or to dissociation, uh, I think that what there are multiple processes that interact to give rise to these phenomena. So I'm just going to rehearse those briefly with you. The reason I say that, in terms of trance at least, and it's true to dissociation as well, to this day there is no clear uh, marker in the brain of, of trance or dissociation. Uh, so there's no one thing that you can point to and say, aha, that person's in a trance. Uh, what you can show is if somebody is highly hypnotizable and you give them a certain task, they will do that task more efficiently. That is to say, the parts of the brain that are needed to do that task will light up more on a functional uh, image, uh, an fMRI or something like that, than parts of the brain that are not needed. So there's a kind of, you could view that as a kind of analogy to focusing, uh, in a way. So you can show that, but there's not one place, aha, there's the place that lights up when you're in a trance. It really depends on what the task is. So the question is, what things do people have to mobilize for these tasks? So this is just a kind of a, uh, uh, another way to list, really. I wouldn't, you know, print, you know all the arrows and stuff don't imply a, a real big deal in terms of process. It's really just a list of different modes of information processing. So one mode we have, or one set of modes we have, is a kind of self-consciousness, right? I'm thinking of myself right now and how I'm coming across to you and where, you know, what I'm going to do next. Uh, that's a kind of self-conscious awareness. There are different varieties of that. There's private self-consciousness, if I'm on my own. There's public self-consciousness, where I might think of how I'm uh, appearing. And you can manipulate those things. If you put a mirror in the room when somebody's uh, filling out questionnaires, you can show they become more self-conscious, even if they're not aware that the mirror is there. So it's like a subliminal effect on people. And, and when you're self-conscious, you access your own models of who you are, who you think you should be, and you try to match your behavior to those things. When you're not self-conscious, which I think for most of us is most of the time, uh, because most of the time we're sort of operating on autopilot or we're paying attention to something outside or whatever, and then your behavior is not as consistent with who you think you are uh, than you might expect. And there's a lot of literature to show that a lot of behavior depends on context. Uh, that depending upon what's just happened or where you are or whatever, we can probably predict some of your behavior better than we can in some instances, than knowing your personality. Uh, you know, an example is like, do you consider yourself a generous person? So you might say, okay, somewhere from zero to 10, here's how generous I am. But whether you give somebody money in a certain experimental setting will be m more predicted by the context and by what's happened just before than by wh where, where, how you rated yourself on that scale, other things being equal. So that's the kind of stuff that is manipulated. Though if we make you self-conscious, if we make you aware in that, self-aware in that setting, then you'll be more consistent with your own typification of yourself, because in effect you're trying to match your behavior quite consciously to your own template. So that 
that kind of mode of being self-aware, self-conscious, self-reflective, self-critical, critical of what comes in vis-a-vis -vis who you think you are, I would say that is a state that is antithetical to the kinds of absorption that we're talking about. To the extent that you do that, you can't get deeply absorbed because it takes a lot of effort and focus and so on to keep critiquing what's going on. But these other states are very possible. So we spend a lot of time, uh, many of us, uh, in a kind of reverie, I mean, daydreaming. Uh, you know, have you ever been in a classroom and you're really bored to tears by the person speaking? There's no, no relation to the current moment. Uh, and you imagine, you know, it's a beautiful sunny day outside and you just imagine being for a walk outside or sitting down by the water somewhere, you know, and you just get lost in that feeling. That's a very common experience, that kind of reverie. Uh, then there's a lot of time that's spent in a kind of uh, 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 mindless behavior, kind of automatic behavior, where you just do things because that's the script. And you know, the example would be if you drive driving home along a very familiar route, uh, where you're sort of aware of leaving, and then you're aware of arriving home, and you can't remember much in between. So what were you doing in between? You're actually doing a lot of complicated things. It's not something you can do with your eyes closed. It's not something you can do uh, drunk. Uh, so you have to be very alert and uh, pay attention. But if there's nothing new that happened, if, if there was no anomalous event, uh, then you're not recording much of a memory of that whole thing. It's really, you're actually doing other things. So that's an example of mindlessness. And mindless behavior is still very rule-governed behavior. Ellen Langer years ago studied how people behave at Xerox machines. You know, if you, you, this used to be a big deal now with PDFs. We don't have to suffer so much with this. But it used to be a big deal to get all your papers copied so you could work with them. And so you're going to the Xerox machine and there's somebody else already there. Do you say, excuse me, I just have a little bit to do or not? Well, it depends on the relative size of your stacks of paper. It depends on how desperate you are. It depends on your relative social status for that other person, what your relationship is. It's a very complex calculation. You can actually work out the rules. If you see enough people, you can start making a calculation of, you know, under such and such circumstances, this person will or won't say it. But people don't know the rules. They don't know the rules. They, they do this. They improvise this. And they may do it very unconsciously, very mindlessly, in effect. And then we have a lot of consciousness that I've called here other consciousness in the sense of, you know, just looking at things, just being, paying attention to things, uh, trying to work out a problem where you may not be very self-conscious during a lot of that time. Now, the reality, again, is these are not mutually exclusive. You move back and forth. I think that there is some interference between some of these uh, because there's only so much bandwidth and particularly so much conscious bandwidth. Uh, and so uh, things can, can get in the way. And I would argue that all the other forms other than self-consciousness can give rise to phenomena that kind of look like dissociation in a way. And what's happening in dissociative performance may be some of those things. And in particular, that there are many things then that gender, engender gaps in experience, many situations where we don't remember what has just happened. Uh, and uh, if something, if our attention is drawn to it, we then will fill in what happened. So, you know, you're sitting in a classroom, you're daydreaming, suddenly the professor asks you, you know, Rima, what, what do you think about so-and-so? Oh, now, now you're in a pickle. And so your brain is working double time to figure out, okay, what was just going on? And can I figure out, can I make a bridge from the last thing, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a kind of shift in attention where you try to scan and figure out and fill in the gap now. Uh, and then you might also say, okay, wait a minute, let me see, this is a class in cultural psychiatry, so we're probably talking about so-and-so. You know, so you do more filling in, and you have all these levels of filling in. And my argument is that this is happening all the time, in effect. This is how we create the subjective experience of seamless consciousness, because we're not having seamless consciousness. We're moving in and out of here and there and everywhere, most of which we're not remembering, because most of which is not important, particularly to us. Uh, but then if somebody says, well, what were you doing? What were you doing? We make up a story that makes it seem as though we were seamlessly in somewhere. Is a pretty superficial story in a way. It's not getting at all the texture. Although we might say, yeah, it was a boring lecture. My mom was wandering a lot of the time. But, you know, we won't have too much memory of all the details of it. So this is a model, then, for how we are taking everyday experience and weaving it together. And the implication is that things can go in both directions. That it's not only that we have sort of um, you know, uh, bits and pieces of experience that we have to weave together into a narrative, but if somebody tells you uh, in a little while you're going to have an experience that's going to be very interesting, and you, but you're not going to remember much of what happens in the future, then you're going to have sort of a narrative going in that direction, because in effect it's creating permission to not remember, creating space not to remember, even an expectation that you not remember or that you not weave this together. It's something different now. You're going to be possessed, and that's a separate experience. And if it's a real possession, which you want to have happen, 
then you, you're not going to remember it. And so that becomes a top-down narrative, or here, a bottom-up narrative that's reshaping experience. So this is the kind of thing I think we need to understand or want to understand to do this. And what I want to do is just talk about this now for a moment at the level of the self, because I've been talking about it mostly at the level of, um, of memory, of, of actual process of memory, and a little bit and when we talk about the social identity disorder or or, dis, or possession, we've talked about it in terms of alterations of, of self-identity, uh, but the question is, what does it mean to be a single person in a way, and is that an automatic outcome, and a natural thing, so that experiencing yourself in some kind of multiple way is anomalous, or could there be ways in which that experience of being multiple people is also natural in a way? Uh, to some degree. So this is a, an extreme example taken from the famous Portuguese uh, poet uh, uh, Fernando Pessoa. Uh, and he talked about having uh, heteronymous selves. I mean, he, in fact, wrote poetry under three or four different names, different kinds of poetry, under completely different names. Uh, and here's how he described himself. I have always, since a child, had the compulsion to augment the world with fictitious personalities. Dreams of mine rigorously constructed, visualized with photographic clarity, understood right into their souls. I was only five years old when already as an isolated child who wanted only to be so, I used to take my companions as my companions various figures from my dreaming, one Captain Thibault, one Chevalier de Pas, and others whom I have now forgotten, whose forgetting, like my imperfect recollection of those two, is one of the great regrets of my life. What is more, this tendency did not go away with childhood. It developed in adolescence, took root as that grew, became finally the, the um, natural form of my spirit. Today I have no personality. All that is human in me I have divided among the various authors of whose work I have been the uh, executant. I am today the point of reunion of a small humanity, which is only mine. So this sounds a bit like dissociative identity disorder, but made into a virtue and a way of life and consciously chosen by an artist. Uh, and here's how he continues. It is, however, simply a case of the dramatist's temperament, raised to the maximum, writing instead of dramas in acts and actions, dramas in, word, in, so, in souls. Instead of, instead, of an, uh, instead of in writing in acts and actions, dramas in souls. This phenomenon, apparently so confused, is in substance as simple as that. I don't deny, though, I favor even the psychiatric explanation. But it must be understood that all the higher activity of the spirit, because it is abnormal, is equally susceptible to any psychiatric interpretation. I do not mind admitting that I may be crazy, but I insist it should be understood that I am not crazy differently from Shakespeare, whatever the relative value of the byproducts of our craziness may be. As a medium in this way, nonetheless, I subsist. I am, however, less real than the others, less coherent, less personal, uh, uh, eminently open to influence by all of them. So it raises this interesting issue. I, I mentioned earlier that some writers, you know, allow these different aspects of self or these images or these persons to be personified and, and active and watch them interacting. Jung years ago talked about a process and used a process he called active imagination in which you would allow your images, image, image people to come alive and just watch what they did and try, instead of trying to control them, so you allow them a kind of autonomy. That kind of imaginative play, which, which we can all do to some degree again, but people will vary, uh, is a kind of generative process in which different aspects of yourself uh, are becoming activated and um, using your own imagination, creative potential, um, and, and uh, uh, cognitive faculties to then generate scenarios and uh, thoughts and ideas and so on. Uh, and so what role does that play, that capacity people have to live out different aspects with the self? And the argument is that uh, in uh, individualistic, Western, monotheistic tradition, there's a very high value put on having a single integrated self and being completely consistent in all ways across that self. But there are other traditions, polytheistic traditions, that acknowledge that there are different aspects to people, there are different gods, there are different directions people can go in, and people may be pushed and pulled and may experience different things. Moreover, to be a mature, healthy person is to respond appropriately to the context, so you might well act different in, differently in different situations. And I remember years ago when I was giving almost the same talk, I mean, I hope it's evolved a little bit, but not necessarily in a direction of more coherence, but in any event, 
Uh, I had a, a colleague, a friend and colleague, or somebody who was attending this course for the first time, who subsequently became a colleague, uh, who grew up in India, and who said, that's very interesting what you're describing, because when I was a child, if, if I was misbehaving, my mother might say, oh, that's Kali. And so use this attribution of the goddess uh, to explain bad behavior as something that comes from another kind of energy, another kind of being. So, which is a, a, a way of not putting you on the line totally. I mean, it's still bad behavior, it's still a problem, it's mischievous, whatever, but it personifies it, it gives it a certain, um, uh, valorizes it even in a certain way, it's connected to, to a goddess, but it also creates this possibility and this notion that you could have different things within you, different uh, ways of being, and that it might be appropriate to act different ways in different senses. So who's to say which is a more complete picture of what a human being is? Our societies then ask that we act in certain ways and that we deal with contradictions or the fact that we're pushed and pulled in different directions in certain ways, and there is uh, one moral language of talking about this as internal struggle and acrasia and, and tensions between uh, aspects of the self, and there's another moral language that sees it as uh, different forces that are out there in the world that push and pull, and one has to respond appropriately to them at different points in time. So what is our stance toward that? So this poem from uh, Fernando uh, Pessoa kind of uh, uh, speaks to that. Uh, the poet is a feigner. He feigns so completely that he even feigns that he is suffering the pains that he is really experiencing. Uh, and those who read what he writes, as they read, sharply feel not the two pains that he had, but only the one that they do not. So it speaks to the double consciousness again, which is incidentally typically what people experience with hypnosis, that they'll say, oh, I felt absorbed uh, with what you were saying, but I was also aware of everything that you were doing. So they'll experience both that, those two levels, and then the idea that that can be imaginatively enacted uh, by people. So I'm not going to, oh, so just the last uh, uh, example of this. Uh, so I've already talked a little bit about this more recent history of the rise of multiple personality disorder. This is an image here from Three Faces of Eve, Joan Woodward playing Three Faces of Eve. And then this other very famous case in the 60s of Sybil, which became a bestseller. And we now know that in the case of Sybil, her therapist essentially coached her to uh, portray these, these, uh, these uh, people that it was at one point Herbert Spiegel, uh, famous uh, uh, psychiatrist and uh, involved in the field of famous for his work in hypnosis, was asked to take over the care of this patient while uh, her therapist went away and he interviewed her and she said, would you like me to play those different roles the way uh, that uh, Dr. So-and-so likes me to do? Uh, so he subsequently wrote, an many, many years later, wrote an article about this sort of debunking this whole thing. That it was very clear that this was a kind of game that was being played, not so consciously on the part of the clinician, but very consciously on the part of the, uh, of the patient. Um, and I've already mentioned this other phenomenon then that relates to this again, to the circulating cultural ideas that then shape people's experience. Uh, and this was a weekend magazine in Honolulu some years ago. On, uh, this is somebody called, uh, I think her name is something like Sky Ambrose, who, and she's been abducted by aliens. And uh, I mentioned also the study by uh, Richard McNally, which I think I have a slide showing here, uh, that when you look at the emotional arousal, the physiological arousal of people who are recalling their experience of alien abduction, it is stronger, or as strong or stronger than people who are recalling traumatic experiences that they actually had. Uh, so this speaks to the issue that our uh, our folk theory of how the mind works not only doesn't think accurately about memory, but doesn't think accurately about imagination, right? Because when we say imagination, we usually say just imagination, which means it's trivial, versus the idea that actually the things that we construct in our own minds, that we rebuild and revisit, can be as powerful and as evocative as anything else uh, that happens, which I think is very important for us to, to recognize. Um, um, this is just returning to the point that was uh, raised earlier when someone was asking about how do you distinguish between uh, psychosis and dissociation. There's also this question of how do you distinguish between positive and negative dissociative experiences. I mean, the first distinction is going to happen before the clinician ever sees people because people, most people's dissociative experiences will never be brought to the clinician because it's not a problem. But it, in a sense, if you're trying to formulate diagnostic criteria, the fundamental issue is, is it this interfering with function? Is it inappropriate socially? And to answer those questions, you have to look at it in context. 
Um, this is, you know, and we have this already. And I don't think these are, these are um, really c going back over the things that we've talked about. So I think I'm going to stop here uh, because I really made all these points. Those are just other ways of saying the same things. I will put them together with the other slides in the right order, so at least you'll have all the words there to look at. But there's nothing additional on that, um, on that information. So we have a few minutes left uh, for uh, questions or comments. I'll, I guess what's the last thing to say? The last thing to say is that DSM-5 is, is considering how to reframe the dissociative disorders to make them more inclusive. And the challenge is to find the right level of abstraction. So for example, can you phrase dissociative identity disorder in such a way that would in, it, include, it would include negative possession experiences? So you don't need other disorders. You would specify what kind of dissociative thing is a problem, but you would have one category because you'd say, look, this is a situation where the person's subjective experience of identity is shifting in some way, and that's a problem. Um, having said that, of course, it's, it's more complicated because if you look back at the donkey possession, first of all, that's not a problem, but if somebody came and said, look, I'm being possessed by the god when I don't want to be, it's not strictly true that they're experiencing their identity is different. Uh, maybe others are. I mean, they're experiencing you know, themselves as absent for part of the time. So exactly how you want to frame this, I think, is a challenge, but the goal really is to find the right level of abstraction so that we can have a, a modest set of categories that would then be useful for people working in very different settings. And in the terms of mental health situations where people do see dissociation uh, as a problem, while most of the time it's a positive thing, and we'll come back to talk about it a bit more in the context of healing, uh, there are situations where it is a problem for people for the reasons that I said. Um, I think really because interacting with other things and, and being used in a negative way or a way that's problematic for people. And under those circumstances, we need a language to talk about it and uh, a strategy for helping people with it. 